This week, Jesus wants us to be light and salt to the world and wonders why we are hiding our lights and our salt is unsalty. The light thing, I get that. It seems like a pretty straightforward metaphor. But unsalty salt? Is that a thing? Some people say absolutely, but I'm not so sure. I get a top layer feeling of what Jesus was getting at, but I think down deep there has to be something more, maybe several things more. So let's take a look at light, salt, water, poo, mud, and other needful things and how they can help us better understand our relationship to the kingdom of God, our personal baggage, God, and one another. Why would you hide a light beneath something? There are reasons, right? Maybe you want to evade detection or to actually be able to see further at night. As a kid, if we wanted to watch it snow outside or if we wanted to see if something was out in the yard, we needed to kill the inside lights. But what Jesus is talking about today is denying light its functionality or so purpose which is illumination. Without illumination, most plants don't photosynthesize. Without it, we wander in darkness. If we have light-like human qualities and aspirations, it gets more difficult, and the reasons to hide it or shut it off fade, especially if we are bearing the light of Christ. Trying to avoid detection runs pretty counter to our Christian purpose and the whole looking out into the darkness and not being able to see fails as part of our mission is going out and illuminating that darkness, not staying behind our windows walls. So some good points can be taken from the metaphor fairly painlessly. But then we get to the advanced metaphor, which is more complicated and unlike Unlike light, we don't get many M's about it. So let's dig in. In our modern culture and in our lifetimes, we have an understanding of what salt's all about, right? But I was surprised to read about the differences in understanding and uses for salt back in Jesus' day. Back then, they had sprinkled it on sacrifices, rubbed it on newborn infants, used it, of course, to flavor things and cure them. There was a specific usage that Jesus was also talking about. In the commentary Word Sunday, it states, in Matthew 5.13, the salt also referred to the leveling agent for patties made from animal manure, the fuel for outdoor ovens used in the time of Jesus. Young family members would form patties with animal dung, mix it in mix in salt, and let the patties dry in the sun. When the fuel patties were lit in an oven, the mixed-in salt would help the patties burn longer and a more even heat. When the fuel was burned out, the family would throw it out onto the road to harden a muddy surface. Well, I had learned these little tidbits some years ago. But this week, one particular segment was really bugging me. And this time, I refuse to get sidetracked. But if salt has lost its saltiness or taste, that just doesn't sound right from a chemistry perspective. I checked that online. Salt, or sodium chloride, is sodium chloride, period. Salt, as salt, cannot lose its saltiness or taste. Now, if salt were mixed in with other things, it would definitely be corrupted or contaminated or diluted. Who wants to test the saltiness of salt mixed in with manure, right? A host of, uh, of other contaminants resulting from mixtures or solutions would seem to affect its saltiness or taste. I had some questions about this, so I decided to resort to the big guns, my go-to. I called my kid. I bet when Nathan sees my number on his telephone in the middle of the day, he steals himself for one or two things, a stupid dad joke 
or a really bizarre, off-the-wall, out-of-nowhere, difficult science question. So I called him up. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Got a second for a chemistry question? I need to know something for my sermon. So, if you mixed salt with cow, and with cow poop, how would you get pure salt back out? And what if you dried it and burned it? Well, I did some preliminary research, and I know salt can't lose its saltiness. The cool thing is, after 24 years, he knows that I have some reason for asking. He takes a deep breath and steps into the corridors of his brain that he hasn't strolled down in a while. I can almost hear him flipping on those lights. The other cool thing is that he takes my questions seriously. As it turns out, that it's a pretty difficult, random question. So we started exploring together. The knowing stuff is him. The Google stuff, that's me. Well, he tells me chlorine has a very high electronegativity. That's how the whole thing started. Then discussion about crystallization, how salt wants to be salt chemically, how you can induce other subs introduce other substances to get other contaminants to fall out, some really nasty water stuff, and just weird stuff with just weird stuff in it. Costs, time, filtering, etc. The thing is, the process always begins with adding water. I knew from my work in a dialysis clinic how to get all that other stuff out of water to have fantastically pure water. The problem was we wanted the pure salt. Now the water as not the water as the pure end product. Nathan told me some history of salt and stuff like that. And I kept saying, yeah, but how? What did that look like? He was on a get on a great do it in the lab path. But it was just so complex, the process that you would have to do. I finally had a flash of inspiration. You know, they do this all the time on a massive scale somehow, because it would be impossible to have as much salt as we do or find it in nature if there wasn't a more simple process other than magic. How on earth does Morton Salt do it? That was the flash of inspiration. Oh my gosh, I can actually contribute to this conversation. Dear Internet, how does Morton Salt make pure salt? It's a multiple vat evaporation system. But in NaCl, or sodium chloride salt, likes being with sodium chloride, NaCl. It crystallizes where contaminants can be drawn off and they continue down a chain of vats until, voila, pure salt is left. So we both started to see the metaphorical ramifications or applications of Jesus' chosen substance. Salt does not lose its saltiness. It may get connected to many contaminants so that it may not be able to be used for its functional purpose, like curing meat or seasoning food. But as long as it's NaCl, sodium chloride, it is salt. And it actually is salty behind all the other interference, all the masks and all the pollutants. It just seems to us that it isn't. Isn't that really how it is with us? The good news is that we are children of God. We are salt. We cannot become any less God's children. We can't lose our saltiness, but we can sure seem like it. We do things to hurt one another. We behave selfishly. We think that we are unlovable or unforgivable. We cease to forgive. We cease to show mercy, love, and kindness. We become enmeshed in those contaminants the mud, the poop, the ashes of the world. We cease to function as what we were created to be. Here comes more metaphor. 
the solution, the solutions, the solution. I love catching an unintentional pun. In the waters of holy baptism, those contaminants are washed away or poured off. Those waters and the process of a chain of daily repentance, that is turning away or detaching from those contaminants, allow us to be effective disciples. In the Stephen King book, Needful Things, a new shop called Needful Things opens in the town of Castle Rock, Maine. The owner, Leland Gaunt, is a charming elderly gentleman who always seems to have the item in stock that is perfectly suited to any customer that comes through his door. The prices are surprisingly low and tempting, considering the merchandise, such as a rare Sandy Koufax baseball card, a carnival glass lampshade, and a fragment of wood believed to be from Noah's Ark, a healing amulet. But he expects each customer also to pay, play a little prank on someone else in Castle Rock. Gaunt knows about all the jealousy and the grudges in that town. And the pranks are his means of ramping them up until the whole town is eventually caught up in hatred and violence. In the end, it is revealed that the needful things were just illusions, seeming to be the things that the people wanted or so desperately needed that they sold their soul for an illusion. King's story is a pretty good parable, really. We can see the contaminants, the illusions, our desires, and how they bound them, how those folks bound themselves to them and lose who they are until they are so mired in the mud that they are unrecognizable as to who and what they were created to be. So salt, as it turns out, is a pretty awesome metaphor. Jesus then issues the call to action for us then to lean into both of the metaphors. We are called to reflect Christ's love, grace, and mercy. And we are made aware that despite all the things we've done and all the things that have made us feel deluded and worthless in Christ and in our baptism, those are forgiven and restoration and reformation and recreation take place, and we are clean and pure children of God. Amen. Amen.